Hi, Fred B. here, and in this video I'm going to be going over some more details about the hairpin circuit I built, and I will be demonstrating a few more things about it. Okay, first off, all of the big capacitors you can see here in this picture I burned out. I, as they are in this image, they worked fine. But then I got the bright idea to, the, there's, on each bank here we have eight capacitors, so we have four pairs of two capacitors in series. And this, because they're in series, this was more than twice the amount, oh, no, this was about half of the amount of total capacitance I needed to make this circuit resonate at 60 cycles. So I had the bright idea to only use one capacitor on each side, you know, a total of four in parallel on each side. And that got me closer to resonance. And then I took off one and I had three on each side. And that, that nailed it. That was it tuned the resonance of the hairpin circuit to about 62, 61 or 62 hertz, and the it was a very it, it produced a very good peak in the voltage of the secondary at being driven from 60 cycles. Then I noticed how really energetic the arc was. And I said to myself, well, what will happen if I open up the gap here? Well, you know, that do anything. And I know from my simulation that when I opened up the gap, it made the circuit more efficient. The, the smaller the gap, the more energy is dissipated in the gap because the lower the breakdown voltage of the gap is, and then the sooner energy flows through it. So we have more energy flowing through the gap, the smaller the gap is. So I went from my original 2 millimeters out to 3 millimeters, and it worked fine. And I said, well, hey, I wonder what will happen if I back it out a little more. And I backed it out to 4 millimeters, and the capacitors went out immediately. It, it ran for maybe a second or two, and it just stopped. There was no popping, no sparks, no smoke. It just stopped. And I said, uh-oh. So then I still had the eight capacitors that I removed. So I reinstalled three more good capacitors, and I put the spark gap back to two millimeters. And I figured out that because I went out to four millimeters, I had at least 12,000 volts building up in across the spark gap. The breakdown voltage of air is 30,000 volts per centimeter, which means 3,000 volts per millimeter. And with 4 millimeters, that was allowing 12,000 volts to build up before, at least 12,000 volts to build up before the spark, the arc would strike. And those capacitors are only 6 kilovolts 6,000 volts apiece, so two capacitors in series, the, each bank is in series with each other, and those series capacitors are in parallel with the spark gap. So it took it right up to the maximum operating voltage, and probably a little bit over, and they you know went right out. So I put the spark gap back to where just the transformer itself without the hairpin being in the circuit would strike an arc that should have limited the total current to about 7,000 volts which should have been well under the 12,000 volts that two of these capacitors in series could handle. So with the three, the second pair of three capacitors in each bank I started it up again and it ran for about 10 seconds and then there was a loud pop on the left hand bank and I saw a flash and it went out again. So this time I think even though the voltage was maintained under the 
maximum for the caps, in all likelihood it was, that the system being in resonance at 60 cycles per second pumped so much current through the capacitors that it took uh, only 10 seconds to, to cause them, cause one to heat up and fail. And because, and when, as soon as one went, then, you know, all of the, the ones on the other side would go. And as soon as one on the other side goes, it was just, they, it took all six of them were ruined. So this was a problem because I have, that was all of the 6,000 volt, 10 nanofarad capacitors I had. I was feeling sad that I, you know, broke my, my new toy. And then I realized I had these capacitors here. I had a whole bunch, about 20 1 nanofarad 6,000 volt capacitors. Now these are way too small to bring the system into residence, but I was hoping at least to get it working again. So I built all new modules, putting two capacitors in series and then having four pairs in parallel again. So here's a, what that looked like with the new small capacitors. Moving on. In this situation, I've been talking with some other folks about the hairpin and they suggested I try to magnetically dampen the arc so I have a pair of quarter inch neodymium magnets. I had a bunch of them so I, I drilled a hole through these little pieces of wood and press fitted some magnets in there and spaced them so that they would you know be a little bit away from the tungsten electrodes in my system. And here we got a top view of that. And there it is mounted on top of the electrodes. And this is the new capacitor banks mounted on the cradle with the magnetic dampener in place. And with this I found that the arc between the electrodes would often jump up and as it jumped up the points where it touched the electrodes would move, start moving back down the electrodes. Kind of like in the fashion if you ever seen a solar flare where it starts small and then as it rises it also lengthens. So that's what I was kind of getting here is it would rise up and it would rise up maybe a quarter of an inch and spread down the, the electrodes a quarter of an inch and then fizz out. So it actually caused the arc to be a little more rough as far as, you know, instead of smoother it caused it to be more rough. So I, you know, that I tried it, it didn't work so good. Don't know why, perhaps it's the arrangement of the magnets or whatever. I noticed that in Tesla's diagrams the magnets are sharpened down to a point and so are the electrodes. Maybe that had something to do with it. Um, I put them far enough away so that the arc would avoid jumping to the magnets and then to the other electrode. So for me this this made things worse rather than better so I canned it. Before trying the mag magnetic quenching. I had tried just putting a fan behind the arc and this actually makes the arc work a little smoother and I think make the lights or lamps shine ever so more brightly or they shine as brightly a little quicker than they do without the fan. Um, in any case the fan makes the arc run a little smoother so I, I prefer the fan. I'll demonstrate both. Now because I shorted out and burned out my capacitors by making the spark gap too big 
and thereby allowing too much voltage to build up in the system. I've now set, with the quenching, I had to make the gap a little smaller. So now it's set for about one millimeter. And in order to prevent the gap from inadvertently getting larger by, you know, I put these screws in the blocks on all four corners to prevent the blocks from moving by accident. This will be a demonstration of the magnetically quenched arc. I had to overdub all these demonstrations because for some reason this new setup just completely wipes out the audio with radio frequency interference as soon as I turn the arc on. So you can see here the arc is jumping sideways. It, this is a new behavior with the magnets. It jumps up and sideways and back down the rods a little bit and it makes the whole arc rougher than without the magnets so I decided this was more trouble instead of less trouble and uh, went back to using, actually it was a fan, but we'll get to that. Just for reference, here's a shot with just the regular gap. You can see it's smoother than the magnetically quenched gap so, so much for that. I had actually tried this fan before I tried the magnetic quenching. The fan works pretty good. I had to close down the gap from two millimeters to one millimeter to make it run more consistently, but the fan seems to make the arc whiter and quench it faster. So this now has become my preferred mode of operation. I forgot to turn the fan on here. And we'll get the fan going. And we'll see how that works. There we go. You can see that it's not jumping around like it was with uh, the magnets. This here is a 40 watt incandescent bulb and it starts out as you can see very dim and then over the course of a minute or so here it it keeps getting brighter and brighter I mean up to a certain level it never really gets bright but it seems to keep increasing in, ten in intensity slowly almost as if it's setting up or collecting a resonance in the system at whatever frequency seems to power it up. Um, if we could just get the, the roughness of the arc to be more smooth, and, and the power would be smooth, that would be a great thing. And I think it's going to take driving the primary with a higher frequency than mains frequency. Carl Palsner said an interesting thing. He said that the more the resistance of the bulb, the brighter it glows. I wanted to see what would happen if we put this bulb across the rods with the shunt taken off. The shunt's just hanging down there. Remember, this is only a 40 watt light bulb. That's that's pretty darn bright for a 40 watt bulb. If you could just get the fluctuations to go away. I was enjoying this and then it burned out. It started arcing internally. Carl Pelsness said that if you let the bulbs run while they're arcing internally, sometimes they explode. So, there's one less 40 watt light bulb in the world. I have yet to see anyone else try this. These are just some iron wire I tied around the tops of the poles and bent so that there's a one millimeter gap between them. 
I tried a bigger gap and it the arc just failed to strike. So this is about the same size as the arc down below. And it starts right up and basically looks the same as the one down below. So, you know, absence of anything unusual here. This was kind of interesting. I wanted to see what the fluorescent tube would do with connections to both ends of the tube. So I just bent some hooks in the iron wire and put a pin in each hook. Maybe the connections were not that good. You know, soldered connections might work better or, you know, like clips. But you'll see it starts up very slow and maybe it, it kind of like the connections get better after a while. But it, it takes a while to get going. But it's almost as if the current warms up the gas inside or just gets it used to being excited by the the voltage in the current and the gas just glows more and more and more you know slowly as time goes by now in the video here it looks like there's a little blue outline around the tube I when I was watching this I failed to notice it directly so I think it's a something that the camera is producing in the lens but after here you know after about a minute or or so it it starts getting pretty bright this is I think less bright than it fully powered on although it was it was a lot brighter than holding the tube with one contact to it or just holding the tube around the rods. It's almost, you know, it almost got going good here. I also wanted to see what the fluorescent tube would do without the shunt connected. And it was pretty impressive. If it could just sort out the roughness and the power going to it, it would almost be useful this way. You can see kind of in the video there's a blue line around the tube, but again, it's, it's an artifact of the camera, I believe. That's almost as bright as normal operation, maybe even brighter. It has more of a bluish tint this way than it does from its regular power supply. To wrap this up, I have here a 12 volt automotive bulb now, on the package this came out of, there was an absence of any indication as to the wattage, but I believe it's 10 watts. And now all these bulbs get warm. So this is, you know, uh, I would say it's definitely hot electricity, whatever is going through here, uh, rather than the so-called cold electricity. Now this little bulb works pretty good. The shunt here is connected. It takes a little bit to start up, but then it glows white hot. Of course, you have the variations with the pulsing power. Now, I have some hypotheses about why these things glow and why they get warm. So we'll get to that in my second analysis video.